I'm going to start with you, Sam. Okay. Let's swap out the idea of metaphorical truth for something a little uh, harder-headed. Heuristics, right? We have heuristics. We use them to perceive the world. They're often highly reliable. In fact, almost everything that you believe that lets you operate has to be a heuristic of some kind. I mean, if you decided to learn to drive and you got into the car and they said, okay, well, it's all quarks out there, right? You need to understand how quarks interact right. with each other. Not useful. Yeah. Right. Not useful, right? What you need are some heuristics in which you can stipulate that there's something called a vehicle out there and you don't have to be overly precise about what it is and you learn to avoid it. Okay. The heuristics vary a lot in quality. Some of them are really good. The periodic tables are really good. Okay. Um, the idea of uh, gravitational potential energy is kind of crappy, right? If I have a phone on a table here, I can tell you how much potential energy it, it has by measuring its mass and its distance from the ground, but if I've got a hole at one depth on one side of the table and another depth on the other side of the table, I can't calculate it because it's a crappy heuristic. Works well enough in regular stuff. Right. Now here's the question. What if these religious texts are heuristics through which most people simplify calculations that they are in no position to do based on the limited amount that they are capable of perceiving, the amount that they understand about the things that are in play. So they're deploying these heuristics maybe to reduce um, things that degrade well-being. If it were mm -hmm. true that religious heuristics uh, increased well-being by allowing people to actually, on average, operate in the world in a way that have that increased well-being, what would you say about them then? Well, I would worry much less about them, obviously. I mean, and, and that's why I don't treat all religions equally. I mean, they're, they're religions I, I literally never think about because I'm not seeing the daily casualties of those belief systems. So, But, but you say that as people get away from fundamental versions of these things, and I'm not advocating for fundamentalism here, but you say yourself, as people get away from the fundamental versions of these things, things tend to go haywire. And so, in, its, in essence, what you're saying is well, that, we, 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 that as people tend to go haywire deploy, in what sense? Well, I thought I was interpreting... Mo multiplicity of interpretations. Right. Well, yeah, but so, pe people are in, That's people the moral are in search of better her heuristics. I think the pressure is some of these heuristics are obviously so bad that there's there's civilizational pressure to find better interpretations better ones, and, yeah. and, and but you said that the fundamentalists have an advantage yeah. what is that advantage it, because if you just go back to the text and say listen i just want to i want to understand what the, these words mean right you get at the first pass the quote literal interpretation right and you're not bringing the, the any f armamentarium you've, you've brought, you've, you've got from the outside, from other parts of culture, to parse the text. You're just trying to, if it's in English and you speak English, you're you're just trying to decode the words, right? right? And when it says, if you're if you're, the girl's not a virgin on her wedding night, take her to her father's doorstep and stone her to death. That you you know what stone means, you know what girl means, you know what father means, and you're you're ninety percent there to a, a, an obvious atrocity. Right? I, I, I get the horror of it, and yeah. we'll get to that in a second. Here. Yeah. But um, but the basic point is to say that the fundamentalists have an advantage is to acknowledge something functional about those stories, which I'm claiming are going to be some kind of evolutionary heuristic for living a life. Doesn't well, they, make they have, them defensible. They have, you know, they have an advantage. It's not an advantage that, it's an advantage, it's a, it's a mimetic advantage. It's an, an advantage, it, ISIS has the advantage when, when, when the people who, who share their interpretation of Islam, uh, they have, you know, it's like it's it's why someone like you know Anwar al could could make YouTube videos that so many people found compelling. It's because it's it's totally straightforward. It's like the advantage is listen, there are a lot of people spending a lot of time lying to you about what these books mean and what the prophet and how he lived, right? I, I you 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 know in your heart that my interpretation of this is correct. You just read the words, right? Uh, and there's a strength in that. There's a, there's an honesty in that. There's a, there's a, it's just, it's clear when it says sacrifice a goat, goat means goat, right? Like you, you don't have to do something else to make it's goat mean simplified. having nothing to do with goat, right? And so that it's, it's an, it's an asymmetric war of, of, if you're going to try to make your dogmas 
more and more palatable by importing stuff that clearly was never even in the worldview of anyone who birthed these religions, you're playing, you're, you're not doing that because you want to live even more by God's word. No, you found some of God's words unacceptable, right? And that's, and every fundamentalist can sniff that out and they're right to sniff it out because in fact, either it is in fact the motivation. Okay, good. So I think we have, we've got a tenuous kind of agreement that there might be some kind of utility, that that utility might be morally questionable sometimes, but that there is some reason that people would resort to a fundamental, simple interpretation because as they depart from that interpretation, things get more difficult and it creates some kind of disadvantage. Well, the part of the problem with that would be that as you move away from the text, you, you fractionate the moral belief system and you end up with a nihilistic si situation. So as you move away from dogmatism, you move towards the parallel danger, which is moral relativism and nihilism. And so hopefully you can find some balance. So let, let me ask you... No, no, I, I want to oh, ask oh, you a question. Oh, yes, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. So, and also, what time do we actually stop this part? We have, it's 10. I just missed the time card. But um, I think we have another couple of minutes. Okay. Okay. So... There's the no question. objective reality to time, I think. <laughs> <laughs> actually, it's a pretty good conversation we could have. But, oh, okay. Um, so here's my question for you, is um, if we agree that there is some way in which religious texts carry some kind of value because they allow people to figure out how to navigate their lives in ways that might reduce suffering, reduce the complexity of the choices that they have to make, presumably you will agree that that would be consistent with an evolutionary interpretation. That the fact that the stories themselves uh, are um, yes. functional would provide an advantage to those who were deploying them. Yes. So here's the problem. Isn't it then also true that those stories are responsive to past environments? And so the claim that these things might be timeless would be suspect. And yes. in fact, you would expect a spectrum of... Uh, durability. Some stories would be right in a brief moment. And, yes. Okay. All that's true. All that's true. So far, so good. Well, so far, so good. This is this is actually, I think, quite excellent. Then, because <laughs> what we have is a recognition that there is something to these belief systems that has to do with practical realities in the past, and we also have an acknowledgement that we cannot trust in these things based on simple faith, because even if they are, can be certain to have worked at some point in the past, we don't know what their relevance is to the present. Right. Okay. Fair enough. All right. I, <laughs> okay. So, okay, so, so I... That's, and I would say that's, that's two things about that. Um, that's exactly why we're having this discussion. And you see what happens in the most profound of such texts is the idea that the process by which your knowledge is updated has to occupy a position in the hierarchy of values that supersedes your reliance on dogma is the fundamental claim. That's why, for example, in Christianity, the notion is, is that the word is the highest of values, and that's the embodied word, and that's the thing that mediates between order and chaos, and everything else has to be subject to that. And I would say that's not a claim that's unique to Christianity. So, for example, okay, you no, see I think I think, we, I think because we're we're, be to, we're being told we're out of time yeah. here. So, I want to give Sam his reaction to that as well, and then we'll move on to Q and A.